Okay. I'm just saying, if you want to connect genetically, we're close, 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 we're more, close, more closely related to pigs than we are apes. Yes, they do. That's why, because they're a closer genetic match. They don't use monkeys or apes. All right, it's time for us to get started. It is 6 o'clock, so here we go. i uh, got a couple of announcements. A couple of announcements to get us started, and then we're going to dive into Jeremiah chapter 3. So we're going to move on to chapter 3, verse 1. And tonight we'll start skipping some verses here and there because a lot of this gets repetitive. Even chapter 3's introduction is a lot like the end of chapter 2. But we're still going to go through it because we want to look at a couple of the illustrations that God gave the prophet to give to the people. Uh, before we do that, though, announcements. Uh, this one, don't forget that guess what happened Saturday night? The time changes again. So, Because guess what our government failed to figure out? How to do away with daylight saving time. Um, I had full confidence that they would somehow mess this up, and they did. So we are still changing our clocks, and we'll probably change our clocks again in the spring, and again next fall, and the spring, and the fall after that, and the spring, and the fall after that, uh, and the spring, and the fall after that, until the day that the Lord calls me home, and I won't have to change my clock ever again. But that's the way it's probably going to work. So don't forget, because as we were saying this morning, if you don't set your clock back, you're going to show up for Sunday school, and the only person that's going to be here is Bob turning the heat on. So you don't want that. So don't forget to set your clock back on Saturday night. Uh, also, then, don't forget that SLT is meeting November the 5th on Sunday at 4 o'clock over in the youth room. Uh, the shoe boxes. There are some more made-up shoe boxes back there. If you want to take them, you can. If you want to take one to fold, they're in the cardboard box to the left of the table as you're looking at the table. There are also instructions on the table on how to send in your money. Don't forget, don't put your money in the box. They don't want you doing that anymore. They want you to either give online or mail it in a separate envelope. That makes it a lot easier for them to process the boxes. So it takes a lot less volunteers and a lot less time that way. And so don't forget to pick those up. They have to be in here by November the 19th, the AM service, because they're going to be delivered to the drop-off location right after the Sunday morning service on the 19th of November. So don't forget that. That needs to be done very quickly if you're going to do it. Also, Christmas meal, I moved the date of the family forum because we didn't want to do family forum and the Christmas dinner the same day, and I did not realize the Christmas dinner had already been scheduled for December 10th. So, updated announcement, the Christmas meal is December 10th, and the family forum is going to be on December 17th. The family forum won't last that long. It is just our end of year budget. We have to do the budget so that we can start spending on January 1st. Uh, we have to have a budget in place, or we're supposed to. It just makes everything a lot simpler if we do. And then we'll do the bigger family forum probably around the third Sunday of January or the fourth. Uh, the reason being is I have to make sure we have all the end of the year accounting done. And sometimes that takes a little longer, so I never know for sure when we're going to do it. So... Uh, that's the schedule for that. Uh, we won't do a whole lot in January other than family forum just because you never know what the weather's going to be like. So everybody enjoyed the snow last night for Halloween. Yeah, I thought it was kind of nice. The trick-or-treaters didn't like it. They were really cold. Everybody came to my door. It was really cold. I think they more wanted to come in and warm up than they wanted candy by 730 when it was really dark out because it got really cold after the sun went down. And we had some nice wind blowing up there in Swayze with a little bit of snow mixed in, so it was really cold. Uh, so it was, um, yeah, not a very nice time to trick-or-treat. Tonight, then, we're going to get started. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, we're going to kind of, again, a little bit repetitive. Uh, we've already gotten some of this. But he's going to, God's going to reach out through the prophet to both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now let me explain to you the dynamic of the northern and the southern kingdom and the way in which Jeremiah identifies them. So the northern kingdom was made up of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it had already been overrun by enemies because God had judged them for their idolatry. And basically they had 
become just like the Canaanite people in the northern kingdom. And God had judged them, and they had been defeated, overrun, and many of them had been carried off into captivity, and their land had been occupied by foreign invaders. At this point, most of the land is probably still under the control of the Assyrian Empire, although some of it, uh, the people have come back to a small extent, so some of it is held by uh, Jewish people again, but not much, and that would be in agreement with the empire that was in control. So that kingdom, or that part, Jeremiah refers to as Israel. The two tribes in the south, which may, are made up of the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah, he refers to as Judah. Uh, and Judah is still in their own land. They still possess the land that God gave them. Jerusalem sits right in the middle of Judah, and Judah has not yet been overcome. It has not yet been defeated. It's still intact. And so when he talks to them, he talks to them both in this prophecy, and God identifies the northern kingdom as Israel and the southern kingdom as Judah. Everybody with me? It's important to understand the distinction. He's going to talk to both of them at the same time, and then he's going to have slightly different messages by the time we get to the start of chapter 4 for each one. He's going to use the northern kingdom, Israel, as an example for Judah, and he's going to challenge Judah for not learning from that example, and he's going to tell us that Judah has actually made him more angry than Israel did, because Judah has been very hypocritical about their idolatry, whereas Israel just embraced it and ran with it. Judah tried to cover it up and pretend that they loved God more than their idols when in fact they did not. And so we'll see that dynamic as we work our way through. We thought we'd get that out of the way at the beginning and make sure that everybody understood those designations as we read. So Israel is the northern kingdom that's been defeated, and Judah is the southern kingdom that is still intact. So in Jeremiah 3.1, this top part, he's actually talking about Israel. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she leaves him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her again? Would that land not be completely defiled? But you are a prostitute with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. So in verse 1, he's talking about something they would be familiar with. He's talking about a wife who had been unfaithful to her husband, and her husband had lawfully given her a decree of divorce. And it would be lawful because she had been unfaithful. And she had went out and married another man, and at some point she wanted to return to the first husband. So that's a, something they would understand, something they were probably familiar with. It wasn't very common, but I'm sure that it had happened. And what he's basically saying is that that's something that's physical in nature. Her unfaithfulness was physical in nature. Uh, this is more of a spiritual issue, but it's the exact same thing. Uh, you had a covenant agreement with God to worship and serve Him, but you were unfaithful to Him, and you went out and served and worshiped idols instead. So with the northern kingdom, God had divorced them. They had broke the covenant agreement. They had been unfaithful. And God had divorced them and turned them over to others, the others that they had desired rather than Him. So these nations where they got the idols from were able to overrun them and carry them off into captivity. So that's the reference at the beginning. And He said, if I had just overlooked this and taken you back when you got into trouble, uh, then I would have been taking back someone or something that had been defiled. And then he shifts gears. So this is a, a really difficult passage to follow because ultimately Jeremiah is speaking directly to Judah and then by extension he's also reaching out to Israel. Uh, but he's delivering this directly to Judah and that's where we get to the second part then of verse 1. He's referring now to Judah. So he's been talking about how he divorced the northern kingdom. He has not yet divorced the southern kingdom. And he says, but you are a prostitute with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. So again, getting back to that issue of they're not just worshiping one or two idols, they're worshiping idols from all around the surrounding nations. Each little town and village has adopted an idol from somewhere else. And they have set up places of worship on every hill and on every uh, town. Uh, many times if you read in Judges, it talks about the fact that they would set like an Asherah pole up in the town square in some of these smaller towns where there were like maybe 20 
or 30 homes and they had a square in the middle, they would put a idol right in the middle of it. And so this is what he's talking about, that they have brought in many gods and they have turned to them and loved them rather than him. And then he says at the end, yet you turn to me. So in a sense, in a way, at this moment in time, this is about a decade into Josiah's reign. He's now a young man, probably in his early 20s. So he's been on the throne for about 13, 14 years at this point when Jeremiah begins to prophesy. Uh, he has been doing a work of reformation. He has been getting rid of the idols. Uh, there have been some difficult times in Israel because the judgment of God is already beginning to unfold on them. And they have, at some level, been turning to God, such as restoring Passover, offering sacrifices in the temple again, reading out loud the law of God, singing the Psalms. Things they had not been doing for decades, they're now doing again. So verse 8, we'll skip for right now. We'll go back to, we'll go back to that later. Verse 2, he says, Raise your eyes to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been violated? He said, in what way have you remained pure? Is there any area in which you have not betrayed the covenant agreement that I had with you? He again compares them again to a prostitute in a slightly different way. He says, you have set for them by the roads like an Arab in the desert, and you have defiled a land with your prostitution and your wickedness. So you're seeing a theme here. God is not only comparing the northern kingdom to an adulterous, adulterous people, uh, he's comparing them to an unfaithful wife. He's also comparing Judah to a prostitute, and he's beginning to do that over and over again, driving that illustration home. In this particular case, where it talks about you have set for them by the roads like an Arab in the desert, we know exactly what that means. It was something that temple prostitutes did. So the temple prostitutes, because there were so many of them, and I think a lot of times we kind of downplay the depravity of the Canaanite people. They were a depraved people. Their entire idol worship system had been designed by sinful men to gratify the desires of the flesh. And so both men and women functioned as temple prostitutes, almost in the role of similar to a priest. Uh, and they were exactly that. They were prostitutes. And there were so many that they would actually line the roads leading to these different places where these idols were set up. And so he's comparing them to that. And we know that because we see that in passages like this in Genesis 38. Now, I'm not really interested in the context, but the context is Judah uh, is looking for um, a way to basically propose marriage to a woman that he met on the side of the road. Uh, and I want you to see how this is worded, though, because it does tell us about the common practice of the day. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend Adolamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. Now look at this woman was sitting by the road and she was dressed up and he asked the people of her place saying, and how does he look for her? He says, where is the temple prostitute who was by the road of Nahum? So he realized that if a woman is sitting out by the road on the, play, on the way to one of the temples, um, he realizes that she would be a temple prostitute. No, notice this too. Not only does Judah understand this, but so do all the people there because they said there have been no temple prostitutes here. They understood this. This was the common knowledge of the day, that when a woman sat out beside the road in her finest clothes, she was a temple prostitute. So you did not want to dress up. And by the way, this goes both ways, not just women, but also men. You did not want to sit beside the road in some of these areas because you would be mistaken for a temple prostitute because there were that many. And that's how they made the connection. They would line the roads. And so young men and women would line the roads and function as temple prostitutes in idol worship. So going back to our verse, when we go back to verse 2, uh, God compares them to one of these temple prostitutes sitting on the side of the road in the desert. And you are constantly prostituting yourselves out spiritually to these idols. You're always looking for a new idol. You're always bringing in new idols. And you're always looking to worship them rather than me. And then he says, because of that, you have defiled the land with your prostitution and your wickedness. So then we see the truth, the reality that they had defiled the land itself. Uh, and we always have to, if you really want to understand Jeremiah and you want to understand Isaiah and Ezekiel, you have to realize just what a big deal it was that they worshiped idols. And we get these little clues as we work our way through books like Jeremiah, where he talks about the insult that it was to God that they would reject the living God 
who had protected them and watched over them and brought them out of slavery, miraculously, done all of those things right in front of them. It's such an insult that they would reject him and instead worship pieces of wood and pieces of stone. And that's exactly how God sees it, because that is the reality of idolatry. People turn away from the living God who created them, gave them life, the one who sustains them and blesses them. They turn away from him and they go off and worship things like money or cars or houses, which then basically in, in function are no different than the idols carved out of stone or the images carved out of trees. It's an insult to God either way, regardless of what the object of your worship is. But to really understand it, it goes even deeper than that. In Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 16, it says, they made him jealous with strange gods. So of course we see God becoming jealous and angry, insulted, hurt that they would, not hurt, that's not a good word, insulted, that they would basically exchange him for something made out of stone or wood. Uh, but not only did they do that, but as we said earlier, and, and we, we see this throughout these Old Testament passages where it gives us these brief descriptions of idol worship in that time, not only did they exchange the living God for a piece of stone or a piece of wood, which is, you know, really just um, crazy. When you know, It's just insane that people would do that. And it's such a betrayal of God and you know, the God who revealed himself to them. But on top of that, with abominations. So the worship was designed to be something that would satisfy the desires of the flesh. So it was a very sinful, uh, it, it just constituted a whole series of sinful activities. And then it says they provoked him to anger. So that's two parts of it. The part of just an insult to God that you would turn away from him to worship a piece of stone or a, a tree. And then you have this whole worship system that there's nothing holy or righteous about it. It's built on depravity. And then there's this. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately whom your fathers did not know. And we see this idea of demons being the driving force behind idols reinforced in Leviticus 17.7. They shall no longer offer their sacrifices to the goat demons with which they play the prostitute. This shall be a permanent statute to them throughout their generations. So there are a couple of different places in the Old Testament where it explains to us that idols were basically the front for a demon. That was what people saw, but that was not the force behind it. So the idols themselves were nothing. They really weren't. They're just pieces of stone and pieces of wood. But the ideology behind the idol, the movement or the power or the force behind the idol was demonic. And so God was being rejected in favor of wood and stone, which is an insult to God. They were living and acting around these idols in completely depraved ways. And then to top it all off, they're actually following after demons rather than God himself, because that's what the idols are fronts for. They're fronts for demons. Idolatry... And I want you to listen clearly to this. Idolatry is probably the greatest defense of all. God does not destroy Egypt for being filled with liars and thieves. He destroys Israel for worshiping idols. The northern kingdom was not wiped out because they were sinners. They'd always been sinners. The northern kingdom was wiped out because they exchanged the living God for a stone or a block of wood. And so there's something bigger at play here than what a lot of people recognize. This is a part of that spiritual war that exists. And God's not going to tolerate this. He never tolerates idolatry, ever, throughout the Old Testament, even into the New. There are continual warnings not to become idolatrous. Verse 3, therefore the showers have been withheld. So why are they crying out to God at all? Well, because of their sin and because their hearts are not repentant. God has been withholding the spring showers. And they need the spring showers because without the spring showers, there's no crops. Uh, in that part of the world, they need the spring showers so that seed doesn't die in the ground. And we do that pretty much here. If you have a really dry spring, you run the risk of not having any harvest at all. You need a moist spring so that the seeds will come up and produce plants and those small, young, tender plants will grow strong from the water in the soil. So if you have a dry spring and a dry early summer, you won't get corn or soybeans, either one, and neither would they get the crops that they needed. He said, so there has been no spring rain. 
And then again, he goes back to this illustration. He says, yet you had a prostitute's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. So he said the temple prostitutes, they're not ashamed of what they do. They're very proud of it. They wear it like a badge of honor. They wear the uniform that goes along with the position. And there's no shame. They don't lower their eyes. They don't lower their heads. They hold their heads high. That's what he means by a prostitute's forehead. They look arrogantly at others. They're actually viewed by others in a very positive way. Uh, In some sense, they were the priests of idolatry. And so they were looked at and held in high regard. He says, you are like that. You should be ashamed, but you refuse to be ashamed. You've exchanged the living God for a piece of stone or a block of wood, and yet you are not ashamed of what you have done. Verse 4 and 5, have you not just, have you not just now called to me my father? So again, keeping in mind that Josiah has been doing this work of restoration and reformation. He's been destroying the temples of the idols. He's been tearing down and grinding into dust the idols themselves. He's been killing the priest uh, and doing away with all the elements of idol worship. He's restored the temple. Uh, Sacrifices are being offered in the temple of God once again for sin. The Passover is being celebrated. The Psalms are being sung. The Word of God is being read in public because they found it. They now know where it's at. They've been copying it and distributing it. All the things that he can do, he's doing. And he says, so you're calling out to me, And you're wondering, will he be angry forever or keep his anger to the end? So they are calling out to God. And the question is, we've been calling out and still the spring rains are not coming. So the harvest is not there or it's very minimal compared to what it should be. Behold, you have spoken and have done evil things and you have had your own way. So this is God's answer. You cry out to me and you're wondering if I'm going to remain angry. But you know what? You have spoken, and you have spoken, and you have done evil things. And up to this point, you have been able to do things the way you want to. You have had your own way in things. Then the Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? Now, now, there's a slight break here. So the problem is, in the chapter and verse divisions, a lot of time we don't see the transitions in messages. So that's actually the end. Verse 5 is the end of a short prophetic message that God delivered through Jeremiah. Now sometime a little later on, and we know it's only a little later on because Josiah is still king, uh, he gets another message, a follow-up message to that one. So you can always, if you want to mark in your Bible between 5 and 6, verses 1 through 5 is one message, and then verse 6 begins another message. So the Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? So God calls the prophet himself. And he says, have you seen what Israel, that northern kingdom, did? She went up on every high hill and under every leafy tree, and she prostituted herself there. Yet I thought, and this was what God said, I thought after she was done, all these, after she has done all these things, she will return to me. So God was looking for the people to go through that and then return back to him. When they reaped the consequence of their sin, the expectation was they would repent, but they did not says, but she did not return. Her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So the northern kingdom, Israel, did not return to God when they were chastised for their sin, for their idolatry. And the meanwhile, the southern kingdom watched. The people who lived there watched the people in the northern kingdom following in the path of the Canaanites. Verse 8 then, he says, And I saw for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a certificate of divorce. So we know why he did it. For all the adulteries of faithless Israel. How did Israel commit adultery? By worshiping and loving idols rather than worshiping and loving the living God. That was the way they committed idolatry and adultery in this illustration. So what he's talking about is he's talking about their idolatry. And he said because of that and their refusal to repent, even after being chastised, he sent her away. Uh, He gave her, in essence, a certificate of divorce. So again, he's using an illustration they would understand. He had found the northern kingdom to be unfaithful. They had betrayed him for other gods, and so he turned them over to the other gods, these blocks of wood and pieces of stone. And he allowed the people who had created those idols to overwhelm them. That's what his people wanted, so he gave them what they wanted. And then he goes on, he says, Yet her treacherous sister Judah, that southern kingdom, did not fear. 
So Judah watched as God turned the northern kingdom over to their own sinful desires. He gave them what they wanted. He gave them over to the idols they worshipped, the demons behind them, and the nations through which they had been developed. He gave them over to them. And Judah watched that, and rather than learning to fear God, rather than learning the danger of idolatry, instead they did the exact same thing. Which in an essence, in a sense, makes it worse. So verse 9, it says, And because of the thoughtlessness, I think in the King James it's lightness. Um, this doesn't mean it's not a big thing. It just means that they entered into it without really any care or fear. Because of the thoughtlessness of her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. So again, you get this really clear explanation of what idols are. They're just stones and trees. They're nothing. They're just rocks and trees. Uh, and yet people will gravitate towards them because of what they represent. That people don't gravitate to idols because of the idol itself. They gravitate to an idol because of the ideology behind it. And it's always an ideology of lust and desire. Idols promise you what you desire. So Baal promised prosperity and fertility. And so the people went and worshipped him. And the promise of that was created by men, and then they built a worship system around it based on their own sinful lusts, their desires. And so it was very sexual in nature. It was very depraved. And so people gravitated towards it. And it was pretty much the same with others. Molech, why do you think they offered their children? It was for prosperity and fertility, which is the irony of it. Since they were already fertile, they had children, and they would offer those children for more. Uh, and they would do that. And the worship practices were built to where the people had control. God, the gods did not, the people did. The gods had to do whatever the people basically demanded they do based on the people's sacrifices, offerings, and actions. And so it was all built by men to benefit men, to gratify men. And so people gravitated towards it. It appealed to their sin nature. If they did not put their faith and trust in the living God and his revelation of himself to them, they were easy pickings for these demonically driven idolatry uh, systems. Uh, for lack of a better term, that's what they were. They were systems of religion built around individual idols. And Israel had brought all these different idols in and all these different systems of worship. And so they had defiled the land, committed adultery. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me. So even though Judah is already beginning to experience the wrath of God that they saw completely poured out on the northern kingdom, they continue on in their rebellion. They refuse to return to God. They refuse to repent. When he says return to me, he's talking about repentance. So he, read this again. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Now this message is, is basically aimed at Jeremiah. God has said to Jeremiah, hey, I want to show you something. I want to reveal something to you. Jeremiah needs to understand the essence of his ministry. So that's what we transitioned to when we got beyond verse 5. And so we moved into a message that was not going out to the people, but was more focused on the prophet himself so that he would understand what was actually going on. Because on the surface, it looks really good what's going on in Judah right now. All the idols are either destroyed or in the process of being destroyed. And Josiah is really cleaning things up. The temple's open again. The word of God's being read. The Psalms are being sung. Sounds like a true revival movement, doesn't it? Sounds like a real reformation. On the outside, it looks like one. But what does God say is actually going on here? Listen to what he says again. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me, which means they did not repent with all her heart, but rather in deception. They didn't repent. They just went through the motions. They just did what they were being demanded. What was, all they did was what was being demanded of them. So Josiah made it very difficult for you to continue to embrace idols. I mean, for one thing, he was executing people. And lots of people. He knew that he couldn't clean up the nation any other way. So he was killing the priests. He was killing some of the prostitutes. Uh, he was killing people who refused to surrender their idols. So if they caught you and you hadn't surrendered them, he was executing people. You can read the stories of how he would actually grind the bones of these false priests up and burn them on these altars. And he would burn these altars to the ground. Uh, and then he would bury them, or he would take the dust when the people had refused to give them up willingly. And there are several stories in the historical accounts. 
and he would cover the people with the dust off of these burnt priests and altars. It's brutal. But he's dealing with the people who refuse to repent. And so he was not having any part of it. Josiah was tough. And they had then finally, at least on the surface, went along to get along. They went along with Josiah's reforms because they really had no choice. Josiah didn't give them a, cho a choice as to whether or not they went along with it. But their heart wasn't in it. And that's what God says then. They're trying to deceive me, but they're not going to be able to do that. They have not returned to me. They have not repented. They have the outward appearance, but there's no inward transformation. They still are in love with their idols, and they're still not in love with me. They're not willing to worship and serve me. So verse 11 says, And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself to be more righteous than treacherous Judah. Two words stand out in verses 10 and 11. Go back to verse 10. That's deception. And in 11, treacherous. So Israel, the northern kingdom that God has already wiped out because of idolatry, he says is actually more righteous than Judah at this stage in Judah's history. He's shown Judah far more grace than Israel uh, because Judah's the last. They're the remnant. And he has labored with them and dealt with them and chastised them, and they have refused to respond with repentance and come back to him. He said, in fact, they're worse. At least Israel never made any pretense of loving him and serving him. They never pretended to repent. Israel was full bore on for idols. They never made any, uh, they never pretended to worship and serve God. They never came down to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices and to read the scriptures and to sing the Psalms. They just built their own religious system based around their idols and they went that way until they were destroyed. Judah's been this way for a while now, up and down, depending on who the king was. If a king like Hezekiah or Josiah came along, they towed the line. And they pretended to love God, and they pretended to worship and serve God. But if they had a king like Ahab or somebody like that, they were just as, <laughs> they were just as depraved as they actually were. They, they just did whatever they wanted. Their heart was always that way. And he says because of that, they're hypocrites. They've been deceptive and treacherous. And so his wrath against them burns even hotter than his wrath against Israel. And so that's what he's telling Jeremiah. He's explaining this to the prophet. So that the prophet understands just how bad Judah is and just how serious their situation is. God is going to pour his wrath out upon Judah, and there's not going to be much left when he's done. Now, in verses 1 through 4, jumping down to chapter 4, just we're going to finish with these four verses. So chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he's going to offer the opportunity to repent. So he's already giving them an opportunity based on Josiah's reforming work. Jeremiah now is going to deliver a message, a message that offers them the opportunity to return, starting with the northern kingdom. A lot of times, I overlooked this for a long time, uh, but he actually sends Jeremiah to present a message to those northern ten tribes. Uh, some of them are back in their own land, working under the uh, basically working under bondage to a foreign power. Some of them have migrated back to Judah for a little more freedom, but there are elements of that northern kingdom that are able to hear the message. So here's the message to the northern kingdom. If you will return, Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. So he says, if you would repent, if you would come back, you should. This is your chance. Do it now. If you want to, if you will, do it now. And, but if you're going to do that, you have to mean it. You can't just do this on the surface. He says, if you will, Israel, return to me, then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detestable things from my presence. Now, what do you think the detestable things are? Idols. These are their idols. He says, you got to get rid of your idols that you still have and come back to me. And, and that's just common sense, by the way. People say, is God, that a test? No, that's just reality. You can't come back to God if you're going to embrace your idols. Because you can't serve God in idols. Even Jesus echoes that in the New Testament, does he not? When he says you cannot serve God and man them. You can't serve the world and serve God. You can't serve uh, idols. You can't serve demons and serve God. You have to pick. That's what he's saying to them. If you will return, you should but you're going to have to pick. This can't be just a surface level return. You have to return with your whole being, all your heart, mind, and soul. So he said, you got to get rid of your idols. And then you got to promise, you got to swear that you're not going to waver. You're not going to go back to them. And then 
You're going to commit yourself, as he says here, as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness. So you're going to commit yourself to living out the law of God. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about living in truth, practicing justice, and living righteously. So you're going to come back and you're going to obey the law of God. And that's, by the way, the essence of the law. Uh, truth, justice, and righteousness. Throughout the law, you see those three terms over and over again. You see them sometimes individually applied to the law. You see them sometimes as a whole group applied to the law, but it is the essence of the law. Truth, justice, and righteousness. He says, you've got to commit yourself to the law and being obedient to it. Then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will boast, for this is what the Lord says. Actually, I should stop there. And in him they will boast, because that's the end of the message to the northern kingdom. If you do that, I'll do a great work in, in your midst, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by that. They'll see how awesome I am. They'll see my glory in you and through you. So that's the message to the northern kingdom, what's left of it. For this is what the Lord says to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem. That's why I should have stopped a little sooner. Uh, this is the message of God to the southern kingdom. Break up your uncultivated ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your hearts. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will spread like fire and burn with no one to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Uh, so in this, we see the elements of repentance, uh, whether it's the first one or the second one. And really, if you combine the two, you see all the elements of repentance. For Judah... Uh, they've already returned at a surface level, but God's explained to them what's more important is your heart. You need to break up those hard hearts. You need to remove that outer shell of sin that you adhere to rather than me. And you need to come back to me. You need to repent and you need to change your ways. If you don't, my wrath will spread like fire and it's going to burn everything and there's not going to be anybody who can help you and it's all going to be your fault because it's all because of your own evil deeds, your sinful deeds, your depravity, your idolatry. And so he's making sure that they understand that this is up to them. They're getting a last chance to repent, but if they don't repent, he is going to destroy them, just like he did the northern kingdom. And so in this, we see the elements of repentance. And it's important to understand the basic elements of repentance. First of all, you have to return back to God. A repentant person has strayed away from God, or they've never known God because they've been in sin their whole life, and they need to come back to the one who made them. They have to return. You have to put away your detestable things. You have to get rid of your idols, those things that you worship, the sins that you treasure. You have to be willing to let go of those. You have to turn away from those things, and you need to come and bear the fruit of repentance, which is obedience. The fruit of repentance is obedience, obedience to the law of God so that you practice truth, justice, and righteousness in your daily life. Not about perfection, it's about intent. And your intention is to serve God by being obedient to Him, to express your love for Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And He knows that to be true. If we love Him, it will be our desire to keep His commandments, and we will strive in that direction. Stop hardening your heart towards God. Break up your fallow ground in this particular place, or break up your uncultivated ground. This is where we begin to soften our hearts rather than harden our hearts towards God. We begin to be more receptive to the Word of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Whereas when we've hardened our hearts, we're not listening. We refuse to listen to the directions of God through His Word and through the convicting of His Spirit. So in the days of Josiah, on the surface, it looked like an amazing revival. It looked awesome. I mean, the people are singing praises to God. They're reading the Word of God at the courtyard of the temple. They're offering the right sacrifices in the right way again because they're following the instructions of Leviticus once more. Uh, they are destroying the idols and their temples and their altars and their groves and their high places. And they are burning it to the ground. And the people sound like they're on board. They are praising God's name with their lips. They are shouting His praises in the streets. They are agreeing with Josiah that this is what needs to be done to stave off the wrath of God. And so it looks like this tremendous revival has broken loose throughout all of Judah. And God says to Jeremiah, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. They haven't repented. Their hearts are still just as wicked as they've always been. They're not letting go of their idols. They're just taking a break because it's convenient for them. It's expedient for them. He says, you need to take this message to them and, and tell them, I know the nature of their hearts. You need to tell them that they need to return to me. You tell the northern kingdom, I'm giving them an opportunity. They don't deserve it. 
All of those stories about that decree of divorce, that northern kingdom, those ten tribes, they don't deserve to be taken back, but God's going to show them grace. And He's offering them a chance to return. And they don't deserve it. It's given to them by the grace of God. They don't have a covenant right to it because they broke the covenant. And when they transgressed the covenant, God wrote them a decree of divorce and sent them away. And he says to them, all by grace, if you want to return, you need to return. So you deliver that message to them um, because they haven't returned yet. And you tell the people of Judah that I know what's going on in their hearts. I know their hearts are still hard. I know that they're still enveloped and enslaved and engrossed in sin. I know they still love their idols, and they need to get rid of those idols and return to me. And so Jeremiah gets this message right in the middle of Josiah's reign that they are not repenting. They are just going along for the moment. And how long did it last? How long did this Reformation revival movement last? Does anybody know when it ended? I I can tell you exactly what day it ended. It ended the day that Josiah died. This was no revival. This was no reformation. It was one man taking a stand for God and pretty much doing it by himself. And because he was in a position that God had put him in, he had the power to make a difference. And he made a difference, but it didn't have any lasting effect on the people that he loved and really wanted to see them come back to God and serve God, and love Him, and follow Him. And they didn't. They went along with Him because they were afraid of Him. Uh, Josiah's movement worked because the people were afraid. Um, As soon as he died, it was just... I don't even know that his body got laid to rest before the idols came back out. You read the historical narratives in Kings and Chronicles... And he dies, and his son, the first of his sons that takes his place, is weak. And immediately the idolatry begins. And it's not long after that 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 son is deposed, and another son takes his place who is actually wicked. So he has a weak son and a wicked son. And the weak son just caves, and the people just overwhelm him. And God then begins to pour his wrath out on them. It's that quick. I mean, he dies in battle trying to save his people, and then it's just downhill from there. Because there was never any repentance. There was never any return to God. And we see this in our day. I mean, it's not something that has gone away. I mean, there are times of excitement and fervor uh, that's often either... In, it's, either it's either whipped up. I think revival, especially in our time, is more of an emotional thing than it is an actual repentance point. Uh, revival is not what we have made it out to be. We make revival out to be uh, this emotional high where people get excited and worked up. And it's very similar to what happens at political rallies and football games where it's a agreed upon uh, thing to be excited about. And it's, it's not really life-changing. Revival, if you will, and I don't even know if I like the term, a reformation and restoration is probably better terms. We talked about this before. Uh, these are legitimate things where people listen to God and repent. And, I mean, real repentance. They turn from sin and they return back to God. They strive after holiness, righteousness. That's what he says. If, you're, if this is going to be real and not just some outward expression of hypocrisy, if this is going to be re- real, then there's going to be some marks such as truth, justice, and righteousness. And so they're treating people the way the Word commands them to treat people. That's what justice is. They're seeking after righteousness. That's holiness. They're obeying the commandments of God and becoming a moral people who live by God's moral standards, not the world's moral standards. And there's going to be truth, that the Word of God is going to triumph over all the ideologies of men. Uh, If you don't see those three things, then it's fake. They're never hard to spot. Because the fake ones never have any of those things to them. They never do. These fake movements, they're just emotional outpourings, uh, often orchestrated by men. And Josiah's not orchestrating this for bad reasons, and I don't think men sometimes do it for bad reasons even today. I think oftentimes they have a sincere desire to see people 
uh, come back to God. But you can't force that through uh, emotional manipulation. You can't force that by basically threatening to put people to death. You can't produce heart change by threatening people. Heart change is up to an individual and then another individual and another individual. And they have to look and say, I'm going to turn away from these things. And I think for Israel at this point, and you read closely in the prophets and in the historical narratives, you would have actually had to have been a worshiper of God to return to God. And I'm not sure most of the people in Israel were ever worshipers of God at any point in their life. I mean, they had lost the word of God for decades. They didn't even know where the law was for probably 40, 50, 60 years. It's a long period of time. They don't really put a number on it, but it's so long that nobody even remembers where it's at, and it's actually buried under piles of other things. That's how long it had been since the word of God had been read anywhere in Israel. So you tell me, how many of those people had ever actually been people of faith at any point? At any point, did they ever offer the right sacrifices or celebrate the Passover in the right way? or really know who God was and love Him and seek to serve Him? Uh, I would say very few. And yet God continues to labor with them. He orchestrates all of this. He puts a man in power who will love Him and seek Him and strive to produce a revival and a reformation. But you cannot produce revival and you cannot make a reformation. The best you can do is proclaim the truth. Josiah does the absolute best that he can. He serves God. He's obedient. He's faithful. He is strong. He does the best that he can. But he can't force this. People have to make a choice. The problem is, and Jeremiah is there to drive this point home, Judah doesn't get to pick the outcome or the consequence of their decision. They just get to make a decision. God determines the outcome and the consequence. And they already know what the outcome and consequence is. It's death. Death and destruction. And they're going to pick that. But there's a little truth that was tucked into the reading tonight and in last week as well. Do you know why they're going to pick that without hesitation? They're going to do it lightly. They're not even going to do it with any thought. It's going to be like a thoughtless thing for them. Here's why they're going to make that decision, and they're going to make the wrong decision, and they're going to do it without any thought. They have no fear of God. You're not going to see real revival and real reformation in the church in America today until the people who make up the church learn to fear God. Because right now, there is no fear of God. None. And some people, yes, but for the majority, I mean, the massive amounts, the answer is no. Um, And that's the problem. That was the problem for them. And a lack of fear of God is a lack of understanding of God, because once you understand God, even at a small level, There's going to be a certain level of fear of God, reverential fear, respect, whatever you want to call it. Uh, There's going to be an understanding of who God is and who you are and how you have to answer to him. He never has to answer to you. God never answers to me. He doesn't have to because he's that much greater than I am. So that's where they made their mistake, and they're going to make the mistake. We all know it's coming because God's already said it's coming. He knows all things. They're going to reject this offer. In fact, Jeremiah is going to preach this offer over and over again in different forms, and they're going to reject it time and time again. As far as...